welcome to our continuing Summer of Psalms Wednesday night study. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Psalm 73, Psalm 73. So go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to Psalm 73 and, and join me in a word of opening prayer. Father, I thank you for this uh, time, as always. It's a blessing to be able to proclaim your truth, and your word is an encouragement and an enlightenment to us. I pray that you will help me to be very clear uh, and, and faithful in to proclaiming your truth, and that your spirit would work in each of our hearts to help us understand it, to believe it, to hold on to it, to embrace it fully, to your glory for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me tell you a little historical incident that happened uh, because I think it's a good way to start off this particular psalm. Back in 2001, uh, there was a missionary flight out of Peru and on this flight was the Bowers family. They had been faithful missionaries for many years. And the Peruvian Air Force mistakenly believed that they were drug dealers, used their military uh, uh, airplanes to shoot at them. And as they shot the plane, they killed Veronica Bowers, the wife in the family, the mother in the family, and seventh, seven month old Charity Bowers, while Jim, the husband, and a six year old boy named Corey survived. So here's a family that has been faithful missionaries for 12 years. And yet they were victims of happenstance. They suffered unfairly because they were mistakenly thought to be drug dealers. And from a theological perspective, that can be hard to reconcile with our faith. Especially when you consider that certainly those that were truly dealing drugs got through safely that night, landed the plane that night, went home to their families that night. When things like that happen, and they happen routinely to one degree or another, when things like that happen, we begin to wonder if God is good, which is what we believe and know to be true, but if God is good, why is life seemingly so unfair? And when we begin to reflect upon things like this, it, if we're not careful, and if we're not looking at the entire picture, it can lead to spiritual confusion, to anger, bitterness, doubts about God, doubts about the value of living faithfully. So when we ask the question, is life fair? We're not really just asking a philosophical question. We're also asking a theological question because we are in essence questioning the goodness and the fairness of God. Well, tonight we're going to look at Psalm 73, which was written by a Levite named Asaph. Asaph was a spiritual leader in his day. He was a worship leader. Uh, he was a priest. Uh, and yet, he was a spiritual leader with doubts, a spiritual leader with concerns. And in this psalm, he tells us that he had the same dilemma about God's fairness, the same questions about God's goodness, uh, the same concerns about the value of serving God that we often face. So it's my hope that we will gain some valuable insights from his experience so that our faith in God's goodness, our confidence in God's fairness remains strong. Now, so in the first half of this sermon, of this sermon rather, but in the first half of this psalm, or this psalm I should say, we're going to see some, some reasons, typical reasons that people question God's goodness and fairness and the reasons that Asaph did question God's goodness and fairness. But in the second half of this psalm, we're also going to see the understanding that Asaph came to uh, that led him to declare, truly God is good to Israel. So that's the introduction. Let's go ahead and look at verse 1. It starts off like this, Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So God, he says, God is good to his people, to those who are pure, to those who are righteous, to those who are godly. 
Now, this, this hardly sounds like a man who had questions and doubts about God's goodness. But we must keep in mind that verse 1 is the final conclusion that Asaph reached. And he reached this conclusion after an intense period of wavering in his faith in God's goodness. Sometimes in the Psalms, they used a literary device of putting their final conclusions at the beginning of the psalm. We don't do that often today, but that's what they would say. This is the conclusion I came to, and then they share how they got to that conclusion and the journey of how they got there. And that's what we begin to see in verse 2. We see that Asaph's confidence in God's goodness was not always there. In verse 2, it says this, Psalm 73, verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. My steps had nearly, or my feet had almost stumbled. My feet had nearly slipped. In this verse, Asaph, Asaph makes it clear that he not, did not always have such confidence uh, in God's goodness and fairness. Uh, he, he had his moments like we have our moments of doubt. Uh, and in some ways that's reassuring to us when we realize that people, people that God used to write the Bible, people that led worship, people who wrote many of the worship psalms also had times of questioning and also had times of confusion. And Asaph just, just is very forthright about it. He says in verse 2, I, I almost stumbled. My feet, talking about his spiritual journey, had almost slipped. He's speaking figuratively and what he's saying is that he came very, very close to losing his faith in God. He, he came close, he, he almost lost his confidence in God's goodness. And he, he came close to going to uh, the place of waywardness and rebellion, falling away from God. You, you see, questions about goodness, God's goodness, questions about fairness, they're not merely academic. They, in, they affect our entire relationship with God. And like Asaph, if we're not careful, we can be very, very close to stumbling, very, very close to slipping away from a healthy, right-believing, confident relationship with God. So one of the lessons we learn from this psalm is that when we have doubts about God's goodness and God's fairness, when we have those doubts, if we have those doubts, we need to be very careful and think very carefully. We need to watch our step because we might just be one step from being very, very far away from God. Now, what led Asaph to this kind of slippery slope of doubt? Well, he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us about four things that troubled him that led him to doubt God's goodness and the fairness of life. And those four things which we're about to read about, he, he, sees, he sees that wicked people, first, have prosperous lives, financially prosperous lives. Secondly, they have healthy lives. Third, they have peaceful lives. And fourth, they have prideful lives. And we'll talk about what each one of those is. But first, let's look at verses 3, to, three through 12, where he's kind of sharing some of the things that troubled him. Psalm 73, verse 3 through 12. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pains until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their heart overflows with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease they increase in riches. What led Asaph to this slippery slope of doubt where he doubted God's goodness and fairness? Well, the first thing is this. He was upset because of the prosperous lives of the wicked. He says in verse 3, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We are often troubled because we don't understand why would God allow the rebellious to do so well in life? This greatly troubled Asaph. I would say it greatly troubles people today, especially when you consider the, the struggles that the righteous often have in not having resources that they may need. See, Asaph, it says here in verse 3, envies the wicked because he, a righteous man, has not experienced the same prosperity that they, the sinful, have. They are prosperous while he struggles. That could certainly make one wonder if life is fair and good. I mean, why is it 
that the single mom who is a Christian has to work two jobs just to pay rent on a one-room efficiency while somebody like Hugh Hefner, wicked and unrepentant, uh, living in uh, the in gross immorality, lives in a mansion with servants. Why, if God is good, why does life seem so unfair? And people often do question God's goodness when they see the prosperity of the wicked. But Asaph was also upset about a second thing. He saw the the what we would call the healthy lives of the wicked. They you know they weren't sick and decrepit and falling apart, but they were generally healthy. This is what he describes in verse four. He says, they, the wicked, have no pangs until death. They live a pretty long, healthy life. Their bodies are fat and sleek. And and in that culture, to be fat and sleek means to be not starving to death. Healthy, whole, muscular, buff, uh, uh, not struggling. And the reality is, is is, it's often sinners who experience the best of health. Well, sometimes it's the saints who suffer prolonged infirmities and illness. I'm not saying that's always true, just not like it's not always true about financial prosperity, but many times it's true, and life doesn't seem fair, and sometimes we will see the wicked live a long, healthy life and then die peacefully in their sleep, while sometimes the faithful Christian dies young after suffering a great deal of pain and suffering. And that's challenging to reconcile with a good and sovereign God when we're only looking at it from a limited human perspective. Asaph is troubled also because he sees the he sees or observes the peaceful lives of the wicked. According to verse five, he says they're not even in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Uh, Asaph is disturbed because, from his perspective, the wicked don't have their their due share of trouble. Uh, and as the NIV says about this verse, the NIV translates it this way: they're, "The wicked are free from burdens that are common." to man. Now we understand that's not true really of anybody's life completely. But from what we can see of people's lives, it, it does seem that sometimes the wicked uh, are relatively free from family problems, sorrowful times, fears, anxieties, troubles, and they seem to experience sometimes a very easy, carefree of life. Asaph using hyperbole to express his point, and the point is simply this, the wicked, the wicked, the sinful, often have easier lives than the righteous. Uh, even the great Charles Spurgeon said this, those who deserve the hottest hell often have the warmest nest, and that certainly is true. That's why in, in verse 12, Asaph says the wicked are always at ease. Again, that's not completely true, but he's just expressing his heart his thoughts, his his uh, frustrations at that moment. So he's been concerned about their financial prosperity. He's concerned about their uh, health. You know, the, the wicked are financially prosperous, their health, their, their lives are easy. And then we see another reason he's concerned, and that is he, he, he sees their, their pridefulness. You know, it's not like these people recognize and are humbled by the fact that they, even though they're sinful, that they've experienced God's blessings. Rather, they're prideful and, and unrepentant and boastful about their wickedness. And that's what we see in verses 6 and, and 11. He, he describes their pride repeatedly. He says, listen, they, they flaunt their pride like a necklace, according to verse 6. In other words, they wear their boastfulness outwardly. Their eyes, according to verse 7, it says their eyes swell out through fatness. That's an ancient way of saying they have a big head. Uh, they, they think very highly of themselves and very little of others. According to verse 8, they don't use their position in life, their prosperous position, to help others, but rather to oppress others. And then, according to verses 9 and 11, they, they, they pridefully scoff at those who do their best to obey God. And they even speak against God, as it says in those two verses, confident that God doesn't see, God doesn't know, God will not act against them. How can these prideful, ungrateful people be the very ones who, of whom it says in verse 12 are always at ease and increasing in riches? Instead of being struck by lightning or le- leprosy for their pride and their boasting and their wickedness, they seem to get away with it. And it just seems that sometimes those who deserve the worst in life get the best. Well, those who deserve the best in the life get 
experience the worst. How can God be good and be fair when the wicked are, are seemingly rewarded and are successful in their sin? Uh, are you beginning to understand why Asaph almost slipped from trusting in God's goodness and fairness? Can you understand why people do struggle sometimes with doubts today? Admittedly, the problem is they're looking at life from only a human perspective. And when you only look at life from a very limited, very narrow, very fleshly perspective, that's going to lead to these kinds of questions and wavering in our faith and confidence and commitment to God. Life is going to seem unfair and God's not going to seem good when we, when we have an incomplete picture and all we see is the prosperity, the peace, and the pride of the wicked. In those kind of situations, we're going to wonder whether it's even worth it to follow God with our whole hearts. And that was the place that Asaph almost got to. And we see that in verse in verses 13 and 14 of Psalm 73, where he says this. He says in Psalm 73, verse 13, All in vain I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. When we look at life from a, just a human perspective, it appears to be in vain, useless, futile to try and live righteously with clean hands and pure heart. Because Asa said, I've done it. I've tried it. Didn't work. My neighbor's a sinner. Doing great. I'm struggling to live righteously every day and, and life is hard. From a human perspective, there seemed to be very little reward in serving God faithfully. It, it seems that it's done no good to be good or to obey God. And from, a, from, from just a pastor's perspective, I can understand where he's coming from. I'm not agreeing with him, but I understand where he's coming from, where Asaph, his conclusions or his, his concerns. I've watched ministers, so or so-called ministers, so, so -called ministers, twist God's word live immoral lives, act boastfully, and yet experience great financial and ministry success. And I've watched good, righteous men of God who are faithful to God's word and holy in their living, barely subsist and have little apparent success after many years of faithfulness. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it does good to be good. And with a very limited human perspective, you can easily say, in vain have I kept my heart clean. But keep in mind, after Asaph looks at life from a heavenly perspective, which he will do here very shortly, he comes to a totally different conclusion. He comes to the conclusion, surely God is good and that his life has been blessed. But before we get there, let's look at the final part of the first half of this psalm where he says in verse 15 through 17, where he says this, If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. So in verses 15 and 16, two things resulted from this frustration uh, and, uh, of, of how Asaph looked at the prosperity, the peace, the pride uh, of the wicked. And the two, frust the two things that resulted <coughs> excuse me, the two things that resulted, one was what I call hazardous lips, and the second was a heavy heart. In verse 15, Asaph says, if he had spoken up, if he had used his lips and he had expressed all of these doubts that he had, that would have been dangerous to the, the spiritual welfare of those he was influencing. He says he would have betrayed God's children by introducing ideas to them that were not true and were incomplete. I want you to pay attention to that because if you're going through doubts and you're not sure about God's goodness and fairness, don't spread that abroad. Don't go on social media Don't and say that. Don't go tell all your friends how you don't think God is good and how unfair life is because you're operating at an emotional level, not seeing the whole picture and your words could negatively impact somebody else. They could betray God's children. Secondly, Asa says, not only were was the, the danger of like what I call hazardous lips, but there's also the danger of a heavy heart. He says when he was reflecting on all of this and looking at the prosperity, the peace, the pride of the wicked, uh, it was wearisome to him, according to verse 16. It was oppressive to him. It was a heavy load that he could not uh, bear. And it is. When you doubt God's goodness, it is a heavy burden to get to bear. 
uh, and, and, and it's not a load I want you to carry, which is one reason I am teaching on this song. What we need to do is get a bigger picture, see things from a heavenly perspective, a true perspective. And that's exactly what Asaph does in verse 17. All the doubts, all the frustrations, all the conclusions that God is not good and life is not fair, all changed in a moment for Asaph. According to verse 17, he says, all of this was true until, let me read that again. I want to make sure I say it right. All of that was true. It says, until he entered the sanctuary of God and he discerned their end. As soon as Asaph saw things from a higher perspective, as soon as he spent some time in the sanctuary, and, and and what it means is spent time in God's presence and he got a spiritual perspective and he discerned the total picture, including the end of the wicked. He realized that he had judged prematurely. He took a snapshot of life. This is what people do all the time. They take a snapshot of life and try to make an accurate determination about life's fairness. But once he sees the whole picture, he comes to the correct conclusion that about God's goodness and how blessed his life really is. And he begins to share this new perspective and this true and better revelation in verses 18 through 28. So let me read those verses and then comment on them. Verse 18. Truly you set them, the wicked, in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. and Afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I might tell of all your works. See, suddenly Asaph has an aha moment. Once he gets into God's sanctuary, once he spends some time in prayer and the word and worship, he gets a, di a deep sense of reality. He discerns their end. You see, the destination matters more than the journey when it comes to spiritual uh, perspective. Uh, it doesn't matter how easy this life is or how hard this life is. It, it, it all, what really matters is where is this life headed? You, know, you, can, you can take an air-conditioned limousine in, in, in luxury and be headed to prison. Or you could be driving a heap, uh, a, a junky car to a, a man to a, a mansion in Beverly Hills. It is the destination that matters more than the journey, and that's when Asaph gives a new conclusion. He says, "I saw their end," and he says, as he says in verse eighteen, he says, "They are in slippery places, spiritually speaking. Life, speaking about life, they may seem secure." The wicked may seem secure. They may seem that they got it made. But in a moment, in a heartbeat, everything changes. Just like when Jesus said, talked about the parable of the rich fool who said, I've got it made. I'm just going to live my life carefree. And God said to that rich fool, you fool, this very night your life is required of you. So don't forget the wicked are in slippery places. Don't forget their end. It says in verse 19, the wicked are utterly destroyed in a moment. That's different than the Christians. We're not in a slippery place. Christians are on the solid rock. Verse 20 talks about it's like waking from a dream. All of their success, all of their joy, all the prosperity and the peace and the pride of the wicked. It's just like a dream. It's like an illusion. As soon as uh, uh, things awake, as soon as things turn around, you see it for what it really is. And so having this new perspective leads Asaph to, 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 instead of questioning God, to a place of shame and repentance. He says in verse 21 and 22, he goes, I had an embittered soul. I had a wrong way of thinking. Verse 22, he says, I was stupid. I was brutish like an animal. I was like an unreasoning beast toward uh, 
you. He, he's saying, I shouldn't have been acting like this. I shouldn't have had these doubts. I shouldn't have been basically falsely accusing God and slandering God. I should have been looking at things from a different perspective. And once he does that, he not only sees the end of the wicked, but he sees his present day blessings, that he's not as bad off as he thinks that he is, that he has blessings that the wicked could never experience. He shares a few of them. The first blessing he shares is in verse 23, God's presence. He says, listen, in verse 23, he says, I am continually with you. What better blessing is there than God's presence? See, God was present with the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and went to the promised land. That's how they got there. God was present with Joseph no matter where he went. His favorable presence is a great blessing. God was was present with David. That's why he had strength and success uh, in every aspect uh, of life, even when he was struggling. You have God's presence. You are blessed, and we should be grateful for that. The second blessing he had that is God's protection. He says in verse 23, you hold my right hand. Whereas the wicked are constantly on slippery places, according to verse 18, God is watching over our life. That doesn't mean we never go through pain or hurt, but it means God is using every single thing we go through, not for harm, but for good. The fourth thing he, or the third thing he has is God's guidance. It says in verse 24, your hand guides me, or you guide me with your counsel. God's guidance. You see, this life is hazardous. It's very easy to come to dead ends, to miss sharp curves, to be, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, there's, there's a lot of misdirection in life, and we can make a wrong turn somewhere. But the good news is, we have been promised, because we've committed our lives to God, that He will direct our step. As it says here in verse 24, you guide me with your counsel. We have the counsel of God's Word and God's Spirit and God's people. And we're very blessed to have those. The fourth blessing he talks about is we go to God's home. In verse 24, he says, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. How in the world can we complain? We have God's presence. We have God's counsel. And then we go to God's home. We have God's protection. We have God's presence. We have God's counsel. And then we go to God's home. Our journey doesn't end in a cemetery. Our journey doesn't end in eternal pain and sorrow. Our journey ends on streets of gold with no pain, no sorrow, no death, just joy, peace, love, and glory. How can we feel shortchanged? How can we feel envious? In verse 25, he talks about how he has blessings on earth and, and then better blessings in heaven. Whom have I in heaven but you, O Lord? And what have I have on earth but you? He's basically saying, I got it good here and I have it even better in eternity. And he's not saying life is always easy. He says in verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail. My, my body may fall apart. I may go through some emotionally tough times. But he goes on to say in verse 26, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So even when I go through tough times bodily or emotionally, God is my strength. And he's also going to ultimately be my portion or my inheritance. And then in the last two verses, he just brings it to a conclusion where he says, verse 27, Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You shall put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. That's verse 27. But then verse 28 says, For the righteous, it is good for me to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I might tell of all your works. And he just basically declaring, I've got it made. You see here, Asaph is in the same circumstances at the end of this psalm as he was at the beginning of this psalm. But his perspective has changed. As soon as he saw things from an eternal heavenly perspective, instead of being envious, he instead of feeling that he had somehow been shortchanged, he recognized the, the wicked, uh, their end, that they're on a slippery slope, and he recognized that he's been blessed not only on this earth, uh, but also ultimately in heaven with glory with God forever. So hopefully you will reflect on that and come away from this psalm thankful for all that God has done and is doing and will do for you uh, as well as for me. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for this psalm and the reminders of how blessed we really are. Help us, Lord, whenever we have been misled, whenever our hearts have become bitter, when we've acted in brutish ways like animals, awaken our hearts, stir up our souls, help us to count our many blessings, to see how good 
you are and to recognize that you are good and life is fair when we see things from the true perspective. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed night.